Well, welcome. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Welcome back for some of you. Um, and also, uh, thank you if you're watching online. Do I need to unmute? Okay, I'm good. Um, so glad we're together. And, uh, you know, we, um, we gather not to um, just hear uh, thought-provoking ideas or sort of like a, a Christian TED Talk or something like that. But we actually meet together to partake in a story that God is telling um, throughout Scripture and now. And I really want to invite us into that because that's what draws us together. And so the, the songs, uh, communion, um, the, the giving liturgy, all of these things are about us coming together to retell this good news gospel story. And what it ultimately does to us is... Um, through the repetition, we're, we're sort of shaped, we're formed into the likeness of Jesus. And so uh, that's why we're here. And so if you're new, um, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And we hope that, uh, too, you would join us for some uh, soul food lunch, um, which I'm very excited about. So um, let me pray as we get into Mark's gospel today. And so, Father, I love you. And um, Lord, as this uh, text is just, it's so big, it's so full. I just pray right now that um, you would use me to help, um, help understand what it means, the way that you uh, have been revealed, um, the things that you're uh, doing in our world and the ways that we um, can engage uh, in that. God, we don't want to um, uh, just do something separately um, from what you're doing, but we want to join you in this story that you're telling. And so be with us in this time and in this place. It's your name we pray. Amen. So I want to begin um, with a couple images here, and um, maybe, maybe this image might spark some hope in you here, okay? This is a 13-year-old boy. His name is Jehan. Uh, it's, this is a rural part of uh, Malaysia, and he's uh, receiving his first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, and that was on Tuesday. And I think that there's this uh, deep desire within us, especially in the season, uh, to have health, right? To move beyond uh, COVID-19 in this season and this disaster that's been caused. Uh, a friend of mine recently told me, um, he said, in this season, I'm, I'm reprioritizing my health. I want my health to be um, the primary focus of my life. And maybe you'd have uh, the same desire. Here's another picture. This is the Global Citizens Live event in Central Park on um, September 25th. And it, was anybody there? Anybody? Pa- okay, there we go. Some people were there. That's great. And um, it looked fun. And when I saw this picture, I thought there is a desire within us um, to be connected to something outside of ourselves, right? To, to join in with a big crowd and to just be sort of consumed, to just be one sort of in this crowd and to celebrate um, together. I saw a few people that are here today um, posting on Instagram last night that they were at, at some concerts. And I'm like, you know what? Nobody invited me. Like, where was, like, what's going on here? Um, one more picture. Here's a picture of a sculpture uh, that's about a five minute walk from here in Union Square. I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's the Sea Injustice um, art. uh, It's like an art display. um, And this is Breonna Taylor, obviously. um, And you can walk over and see it uh, after you have some soul food. And what I realized is that there is a deep desire culturally and within us to see justice done, right? To see injustice come to an end, to see harmony and peace take place. And so we can stand in unison with one another as, um, in, 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 in some ways, in protest. And the reason we do these things is because we desire health. We desire community. We desire justice. And so we want that collectively. Like we want our world to be at peace. We want to be done with racism and hunger and homelessness and abuse and human trafficking. And we long for the day that there's no war or violence, right? And, and I, I don't mean that... Um, um, we long for it because we're like really good people, right? That's, that's not what actually I'm getting at. What I'm saying is, is like from the inception of who you were created to be, these things are inside of you. And equally so inside of us is desires um, for ourselves, right? We see injustice, but we don't always act, right? There's some tension in us where we're, we're not quite making the right choice or we put ourselves before the collective whole, the group, Right? And so we have a way of seeing the world that seems right to us. We have a system uh, internally of right and wrong. And in some ways, maybe maybe that's why you're here to say, I want to calibrate how I sense right and wrong. And that would be a desire of yours. I heard recently, I was in in a podcast, and I think it really encapsulates what I'm getting at here, is that we desire the kingdom without the king. 
And this is our problem. We desire the kingdom without the king. We want the elements of the kingdom, but the authority and the voice telling us what to do. Yeah, we'll take that and we'll leave that to the side, right? We want community, health, justice, peace, love, but the king, no thank you. And I think that this is um, the, the problem area in some ways of our culture is what then ultimately roots us, what then ultimately gives us a sort of foundation to live uh, within if we're constantly piecing together. And I, and I wanted to use those pictures, um, and, and I said as a way of hope, because I think if we look at those pictures, we say, yes, we so desire that. Right, I even look at that crowd and I think I so desire a bit of normalcy, going into a place and not having to think about um, a virus or to think about what it, the implications of having friends over for dinner. I recently read a book um, by Tara Isabel Burton called Strange Rights, New Religions for a Godless World. And what she captures in her book is the religious impulses that we have. And so she says um, that the religious impulses we have have actually been refocused towards self-care, wellness culture, social justice, uh, to bodybuilding, weightlifting. All of these ways of um, they're, they're still religions in a sense, right? Uh, one of the examples she uses in her book is uh, Soul Cycle. And um, Soul Cycle, she says, is, is uh, more than just a good workout, but it's a place where people worship where people relieve, are relieved from uh, stress. And so I was like, is this, this seems like a little bit of a stretch. So I go on their website and no joke, one of their websites I, at the bottom, it says more ways to find your soul. And then I dug a little deeper and it says, come for the body, this is terrible. Come for the body, but stay for the breakthrough. <laughs> there you go, it's like a little delay, right? A little delay. Come for the body, but stay th- for the breakthrough, right? What is it doing? It's tapping into the religious impulses that we have, right? It's tapping into a little bit of a kingdom. And so you, she would probably go, she would, if she were here, she would, uh, she would say, it's a kingdom, right? Like soul cycle in and of itself is a kingdom. The promise is more than a good workout, but a holistic experience, emotional, physical, spiritual. And so she calls this group that's, um, and a lot of us can identify in this area, But she calls this group the remix, those who would describe themselves as sort of spiritual but not religious. And this is what she says in her book. She says, today's remixed, reject and evaluate yourself here, all right? It's easy to point fingers at other people, but evaluate yourself here. Today's remix, reject authority, institution, creed, and moral universalism. They value intuition, personal feeling, and experiences. They demand to rewrite their own scripts about how the universe and human beings operate. Shaped by the twin forces of creative communicative internet, internet and consumer capitalism, today's remixed don't want to receive doctrine to assent automatically to a creed. They want to choose and more often than not purchase the spiritual path that feels more authentic, more meaningful to them. They prioritize intuitional spirituality over institutional religion. And they want, when available, institutional options, when they fail to suit their needs, the freedom to mix and match, to create their own daily rituals and practices and belief systems. I know there's a lot there, so I'll give you a second to sort of take it in. A spiritual path that feels more authentic, right? Spiritual, but not religious. And I know that's all, that's all, that's all, it's a little wordy. There's a lot going on there, but what we can actually begin to evaluate in ourselves is the way in which we seek out and build kingdoms, how we want to be included, how we spend our money. And I actually think that this may be uh, sort of a litmus test. She says by the twin forces of the internet, right? And consumer capitalism. And so those things drive our behavior in so many ways. And so what I want to submit to you today is that the offer that Jesus has in Mark chapter 1 encompasses all of the goodness of the kingdom, right? Peace, justice, love, health, community, belonging, all these things. But it comes through him as the king, right? We don't just have to like mix and match and, and make it all up. But the offer of the kingdom comes through the king. And so let's not get too far, uh, far ahead of ourselves. Uh, where we've been in Mark's gospel, um, Jesus is actually um, beginning to assert himself. A lot has happened, it seems like, to Jesus, but now he's stepping onto the scene and he has some things um, to say. And so last week we looked at his baptism, uh, his identity we were learning, and our identity, um, because of that, is freely given. 
It, it, we, we don't have to gain it. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to accomplish it. But the father speaks a blessing over his son. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And then Jesus is driven out for 40 days of testing. And here in our passage, Jesus is back. He steps onto the scene and he has some really bold things to say about who he is. Verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And this is like um, if you if you ever like had a physical Bible anymore, this would be like something you'd want to circle, underline, highlight, because um, it's it's what's going to Jesus is going to keep coming back to. Um, it's, it's what's sending him out with purpose into the next thing. And um, a lot of times uh, Christians pretend like Jesus came, um, you know, at Christmas and Easter. And that, that, that's how a lot of people look at it, right? Jesus was born, right? And, and at Christmas we celebrate the baby Jesus. And then we're like, let's rush to Easter, right? And let's get him risen, uh, let's, let's, let's kill him first and then let's, let's get him risen, right? And so it's like this really quick narrative. But in some ways, what, what this verse or what this passage of scripture is, is telling us, it's saying, why did Jesus live? Like, what was, what was Jesus about when he lived? And I think that's what's, what I like about going so slow through this book is we're not rushing to, to resurrect Jesus or to have him born. But we're actually seeing that Jesus had things to say and things to do when he was here on earth, right? He, he confronted corruption and hypocrisy. Jesus is overturning tables, healing the blind and the sick, hosting a meal for his imperfect friend, washing dirty feet. And so the kingdom of God, this message of the kingdom of God is about life on earth as much as it is about eternity in heaven. And so I want to break this down, this this passage, really just verse 15, to really grasp why this matters today, why this matters um, today. And so here's Jesus's message. The time is fulfilled time, right? Uh, it's kind of a, uh, an ethereal topic. When I was reading the passage of scripture this week, I thought time feels so elusive. Like I, I, it's like once I feel like I'm caught up on something, I'm behind on something else. It's like time is escaping me. What's well, important uh, to understand in the Greek, there are actually two words for time. There's chronos and there's kairos. Chronos is like, um, uh, think literal minutes and second timed. Um, it's uh, 1124 a.m. That's, that's what it's saying. Um, Kronos is forward moving time. It's uh, measured with clock, with the, with the sun uh, rising and with the sun setting. It's more um, literal uh, a means of time. But the other Greek word here for time is the word kairos. And uh, it's deep time. Uh, it's less literal, but it's more uh, significant time. I was looking for um, a way of understanding this idea of time, and I came across this picture. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody? Some, some nerds in the room? There you go. Um, and so I, I did a, a fair bit of learning about surrealism uh, this week. Uh, Salvador Dali, uh, this uh, painting is called uh, The Persistence of Memory. It, it hangs at the MoMA. And I learned, which was really cool, is this painting is very small. Uh, it's, it's like about an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, maybe a little bit bigger. And um, it's a really fascinating um, piece. But as I got to looking at it, I thought this perfectly illustrates the difference between uh, Kronos and Kairos. And so uh, what you see in here is um, you see literal time, right? Kronos, you see the, the clocks. But it really is not about that, right? The time is melting away. Time feels elusive. The, the time is escaping us. There's a dead tree that the clock is hanging on. Uh, there's some rocks in the distance. I don't know what this figure is, but I read a blog that um, basically um, Dolly said, like, that's me. And I don't know how or why. I, you can, that's up for interpretation. I guess that's surrealism in and of itself. But... Uh, he painted this in what he called the paranoic critical method. He would self-induce a hypnotic state that he claimed would allow him to break free of reality. And his hope was, this is a quote here from him. He says, once I was unfettered, the visions for my painting might begin. And I thought, you're painting Kronos, but you're thinking Kairos, right? Like you're thinking deep time. You're not thinking literal. There's nothing about surrealism uh, really that makes you think this is literal. So it presents Kronos, like literal time, but it feels like Kairos, meaning change is coming. 
It makes you think something is on the horizon. And so Kronos is a quantitative time. Kairos is qualitative moments. Something has been brought to a crisis or a fulcrum point. And so Kairos is the time that defines us. We know this time. It's time that's crossroads, a teachable moment, the opportune hour. And it's a moment for um, God's activity. It's a moment of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God where things will never be the same. And this is what Jesus is saying is the time has come. This is God's opportune hour to work. And you and I know this, right? These are moments in our life where we say, I need to wake up and pay attention. God might be trying to teach me something. It may be a rock bottom moment for our life. But the point here, whatever it might be, is that God is at work in that moment. A new job, a new city, a new relationship. Maybe even it, it, uh, your, your uh, Kairos moment looks mundane to other people. But for you, it's a season where things are clicking in your brain. And you're saying, uh-huh. Yeah, I, I know something special about this. And I don't think that we, um, like I was evaluating this in my own life and thought, oh, this is so easy. The day I got married, you know, the day my daughter was born, like you, you, you think, oh, those are all Kairos moments. And I would say, absolutely, those are. But seasons of hardship or depression can be moments like this too. And this is really important to understand. It doesn't have to all be positive. Like if you think about Jesus, like Jesus came into human history to what? To suffer. And so these can be moments where God is actually trying to speak to us, where he's at work, where we need to be attuned to his voice or to the voice of others that might be trying to give us a word of hope. And so this is what Jesus is is saying here in verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus is saying, I'm the fulfillment. I'm the fulfillment to Israel's story. I'm the long-awaited king. And what am I doing? I'm ushering in a kingdom. Now, the A number one thing that Jesus talked about was the kingdom of God. And so it seems like it's probably uh, something important that we could like spend some time grasping what exactly the, the kingdom of God is, right? Um, the, the parables that Jesus taught. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of God is like leaden for bread. The kingdom of God is a mustard seed. Uh, a command, right? Uh, seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, What about a prayer? The end of the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm like, yeah, we probably should find out what a kingdom is, right? We probably should grasp what this is. One scholar said, the long for revolution is now underway. Jesus is the marker of this long awaited revolution. So um, we probably need a a little bit of maybe a stepping stone, right? This this idea of a kingdom is um, we don't live in a monarchy, obviously. Um, And so it's quite difficult for us to grasp uh, what a kingdom is, how it's run. And I know in your mind, you're like, but I saw Game of Thrones. I know you're you still we still don't understand. Right. So the Israelite people, right, they are waiting, waiting, waiting for a king. And they thought it was going to be a political leader. And so they are under uh, Roman oppression uh, and there are uh, it was bad persecutions, um, killing, you name it. And their hope was in God bringing a king to rule them again, who would care for them, who would provide for them, who would be over them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus steps onto the scene and says, I'm bringing a kingdom. I'm bringing a rule and a reign. And you and I are like, oh, cool, man. Like, that's awesome. But the Israelite people are like, wait, is is he for real? Like, is this a real thing that like the thing that we have been waiting for has begun now? The restoration of humanity, the restoration of our culture, the restoration of like the entire cosmos Hope is present again. That's what they would be hearing. You and I are like, oh, okay, that's cool, Jesus. Like, get to dying so so you can save me, right? But that's not it. We we miss it. A kingdom is a territory or a domain governed by a king or a queen. And um, a a king or a, a queen is called a lord in their kingdom. And what does a lord do? A lord is someone with power. A lord is someone with authority and with influence. And the, the, the king or the queen has absolute authority over people and a responsibility for their well-being. And that this is what Jesus is saying. Like, I'm bringing like a, a whole entire kingdom to bear. Um, maybe the closest thing we understand to um, like a lord is like a landlord. I know it sounds kind of silly, but this person that has dominion over your building, I know they're not caring very well for your building anyway, but... It's a way of thinking about how someone cares. And so a kingdom has a king or a lord. They rule over. They rule a territory or a domain. 
You and I are citizens of said kingdom, right? Inside of that, there are a code of ethics, right? There is a way of acceptable lifestyles and conducts. There's a commonwealth. There's a way of economic security, a way of provision for us. And then inside of that, there's a social culture, traditions and procedures. And so it's all encompassing. And so here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I have an all encompassing way and I'm asking you to join my way. I have an all encompassing way. I I have a way for you to think about your money. I have a new way for you to think about um, your traditions and your procedures. I have a new way for you to be in family and in relationship. And so the, the kingdom is so much bigger. Dallas Willard says the kingdom of God is the range of his effective will. What does it mean? The range of his effective will is everywhere, right? And it's, it's all of it. And that's what the kingdom of God breaking through um, means. And so Jesus is stepping onto the scene to say, this is a new human order. There, there's a new person in town to rule and reign and do everything. Power, possessions, recognition, success. It's all happening a new way. And it's my way because guess who I am? I'm King Jesus. That's who I am. And and we don't often think of Jesus in this way, like this idea that Jesus is king. But if he's saying, I'm ushering in a new kingdom, what is he saying? He's saying, I'm the king. And and this is the way that it's going to be. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, So at our uh, community group on Tuesday night, we look at this passage of scripture. And um, one of my friends, I'm so glad he finally said it in our group. He says, I just... I just don't know if I like this verse. I'm just being honest. Like, repent and believe. It seems like somebody like holding up a sign, yelling at me, like telling me that I'm gonna go to hell. And it actually really got me thinking this week about uh, when I became a Christian. I became a Christian at 13 and man, I took it personally. Like I, I took it so personally. Like I have a journal, I still have it. I would write prayers in my journal. Um, probably some of the most honest things I, I've, I've ever prayed in my life. I was so devout. Um, I invited everyone. Like, I was probably so annoying inviting people to church. Like, I raised my hand in worship. Like, I, w- I wanted to be present. I wanted to learn. Like, I was there and I was ready. Um, I- I'm going to share this with you, and I wish I- I'm going to wish I didn't. My AOL screen name was, was the name of. Shut up. <laughs> I don't know if I could say that, but it's fine. Yeah. Um, was the name of my church and like this Christian screamo song. And so I'll share it with you. It's so embarrassing. The name of my church at the time was called CCV, Christ Church of the Valley. Um, And it was, my screen name was CCV, I am fireproof. And so I was like, and the lyrics are so bad. It's like the devil can't get a hold of me. Like all this, it's terrible. You know, no wonder it was like a very lonely existence on AOL. Like no one's, I am messaging me back. My, I think my dad, legitimately in this season, I think my dad was concerned with my obsession with Jesus. Like, I always wanted to be at church, and I think he was really concerned. And I had a really, a part of it is that I was really devout, and I think that part of it was really good. And maybe, maybe some of you have had this experience, or maybe you've never had this experience, but you've met someone. You're like, they're crazy about Jesus. It drives me nuts. But I think I had this really simple idea then. I found out that I was a sinner bound for hell, and I needed someone to save me from that. It was like, that was it, right? I was a sinner going to hell and Jesus saved me. And I was actually overwhelmed in this season by the fact that Jesus died for me. Like that made a lot of sense to me in that season. But I look back, I, I, I think if I could evaluate that season of my life, I think I was a Christian, but I don't know if I was a disciple. Like, I think I grasped like what it meant, like what happened, but I don't think I was like really following Jesus. It was a beautiful season maybe, but it was incomplete. And it's not that it wasn't good enough, it's that it was too individualistic, right? I was consumed with performance, getting it right, what other people thought, and sort of presenting myself in this way. But when I read the Gospels, um, we spend so much time talking about life after death when Jesus is actually teaching us how to live in the here and now and to bring about his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And, And I think that's what Jesus is getting at in this passage is he's saying, I'm bringing about a kingdom that's already here but it's not yet. The already but not yet here kingdom. I don't know if you've ever uh, heard this, um, and I, I don't always love diagrams like this because they, they can feel a little like cultish, but here's what Jesus is, is saying in this diagram. Um, he's saying there's this age, the present age, and there's a marker, right? The marker is the first coming of Christ, the outpouring of the Spirit, the resurrection, 
And this is a marker where he's saying, I'm inaugurating my kingdom, right? Already. It's already here. In fact, the scriptures say um, that you and I are already adopted, that you and I are already saved, that you and I are, are already raised with Christ. And so we live in this sort of like in-between phase because what's the promise? There's an age to come. The second coming of Christ, the general resurrection of the dead. And what does that mean? It means we are being adopted. We are being saved. We are being raised. So what does that mean? Like even the Bible seems to contra- Paul seems to contradict himself when he says these statements. And here's what it, here's what it means. It means that the kingdom is actually breaking through in the here and in the, in the now, but it's also not yet. And so the goodness of the kingdom, the things that we talked about, the health and the community and the beauty, uh, the, the healing and the hope, all of those things, they poke through, but it's not here yet fully. And so we live in that in-between space. And I literally, I, I like saw this diagram and I'm like, probably something is wrong with it theologically. And so I like went through every part of it and I was like, no, I, I actually think that's sound. We live in this age We're longing for the age to come. We see goodness. Like we want to be a part of the things that are happening. But it doesn't, they they seem to fall short. Like I even look around the room and I think about friends that are in here that are like a part of healing people's bodies. And it's like, that's it. That's like a little bit of the kingdom coming on earth. I see people in here that are creating culture um, through dance or music. And it's like, that's it. That's a bit of the kingdom come to earth, right? I see people helping students um, enroll in college and it's a way of the kingdom poking through and it's beautiful, right? This is you and I um, culture making. This is what we get to be a part of and yet it's not here yet. Uh, Emily was talking about um, the sun. Like if today would be the most perfect day if at some point you were walking and the sun just, um, sh- it shined on you for like a minute, right? That would be like this poking through moment. You'd feel the warmth of it and you'd say, Oh, that's so, it's so nice to have that on a dreary day like that. And I think that's what the kingdom is like. It's like, it's poking through. And so that individual way that I understood my faith, um, I would say it was important, right? But I think we've oversold it. I think we've oversold the, the personal and the individual. Um, one writer I was reading this week said, I believe the word gospel has been hijacked by what we believe about personal salvation. And the gospel itself has been reshaped to facilitate making decisions, right? There's like a line that like churches are just trying to like get people across and they're like, all right, they're saved, right? They're saved. But there's no plan after that to help this person follow Jesus and enact the kingdom of God. And it, it, you just feel so lost, right? You're just like, well, what am I supposed to do now? Like, how do, how do I have a vision for going to work and feeling like what I'm doing is valuable? And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, the kingdom, yes, it is about you. Or I shouldn't say it's about you, but it is for you, right? And he's saying, I'm inviting you into a really big story, but it's so that you can be your truest self, so you can go and enact the kingdom in this way. And that's, so that's where I want to kind of uh, take us. It's sort of a preview for what's to come. Um, as I was reading this passage, I realized that the next handful of chapters are about Jesus enacting this kingdom. And so we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the features of how Jesus enacts his kingdom, what it looks like, what, what do healings really mean and what, what does that type of deliverance look like? Um, there's some crazy passages of scripture where like Jesus is exercising demons. We're gonna figure out what that means for us because I, I think it's important to figure out, God, it, it, it doesn't seem like that's happening today, but how do we, how do we realize that in this time? And so um, uh, uh, next week, really fun. I'm very excited about this. A friend of ours um, is going to be preaching. Um, she is from bed Hey, buddy. <laughs> Mine would be much worse. So, you know, it's all good. Um, and she's from bed She's going to be coming and sharing sort of what are the implications of, of the kingdom of God, like here and now. But I want to preview it. Um, this, this, uh, these seven here, it's uh, the marks of the kingdom. These seven things actually, um, some really smart scholars have actually gone and compared the book of Isaiah and um, in the Gospels and have basically put together what are the markers of the kingdom of God in the life and ministry of Jesus? What are those things in comparison to one another? And they actually came up with something very practical, and I, I think this is really helpful. Um, I don't have time to do it, but they all come with scriptures from Isaiah, and then I think they're from Luke chapter 4. Um, but deliverance and salvation, this is a marker of the kingdom of God. Um, freedom from the captive, right? Freedom for the oppressed. Uh, justice, peace, 
healing, the rebuilding of community, joy, and the experience of God's presence. And what I hope that this does is I hope it takes us out of this personal personal view of, of like salvation. We're like, oh, Jesus died for me. It's all about me, you know? What this actually does is we say, God is actually enacting a kingdom. We get to join in and be a part of it. And God is at work. He is doing things and we join him. So how do we do this? I just want to share this, uh, this, this, um, this picture with you. Uh, and if you want those, I can, I can send them to you. Uh, this is what's called the gospel arc. Uh, is anybody familiar with this? Okay, a few of you. So this is the, the, the biblical story in really cool graphics and uh, simplified. And essentially what happens is in that sort of personal view of salvation and what God's doing is we truncate it. We just stay in the middle, right? You're a sinner bound for hell. You need Jesus, right? It's fall and redemption, but it doesn't take in any part of the larger story. And so we start with creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what does it say in Genesis 1 and 2 over and over and over and over and again? It says it is good, right? And so what were we created for? We were actually created for good, right? We, we were created to bring about life and flourishing and to be co-creators with God. We were created um, to, to love and to, to be in the garden with others. And so we were created for goodness. But, of course, we know the story. The, the fall, sin entered the world. We fall short of God's standard. We don't trust God. We disobey God. We put ourselves before God and other. And it, it's, um, we think of sin sometimes too low, right? We pitch too low. We say um, sin is breaking God's law, and it's bigger than that. Sin is breaking God's heart, right? Now, Martin Luther said that... Um, Sin is a life turned inwardly on itself. It's, it's the inability to see outside of the self. And so um, there is fall. We are sinful man. But what makes us right is the question. Redemption. This is a story of Jesus, right? In, in Genesis chapter 12, um, God comes to a man named Abraham and he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and you're going to be my people. And that's when Israel uh, w- was blessed and, and, and the story of Israel was enacted. But Israel keeps going back to their old ways, right? God says, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Israel says, we got this. Wait, we need you. We got this. We need you. And so it's this back and forth. And through that lineage, the story of redemption in the person of Jesus comes about. And that's the life and um, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus is a story of redemption. But we, see, we, we stay in that, that middle space too long. We, we don't actually build out further what's taking place. What about this idea of restoration? God is going to make all things new at the consummation of all things. And here's what we need to grasp. Kirk Cameron really messed things up in our theology, right? Do you guys remember Left Behind series? It's, it's all, it got us all messed up about how we think about God and what he's doing. Despite popular belief, God is not going to whisk us away from the material and take us to the ethereal. That's that's not what the Bible teaches. And and I think this is really, really important for us to understand is that God is actually um, coming back and he's going to bring a new city, an earthly Jerusalem. And this is what it says in Revelation chapter 21. This is the kingdom that we long for, um, the return of uh, that creation narrative. Then I saw the new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne, Jesus, said, Behold, I'm making all things new. This is like the bigger vision that God is coming back to bring us back new. And he called our world good. He's not, he's not trying to say, like, we got to escape earth as fast as possible. That's, that's not it. He's not throwing earth in the trash. He's saying, I'm coming to redeem all things on earth. And so the question naturally becomes, Russell, what does all of that have to do with me? Right? That's like that's the natural thing. You're like, that's, that sounds good. I'm, I'm buying into that. I want to be a church that seeks the flourishing of our city, that looks outside of ourselves, that, bring, um, that brings about or that joins God in him bringing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so um, I think sometimes we're so apt to come to church and say, I need advice right now. I need wisdom. And there are moments for that. There really are. But there's also moments in our lives where we actually need to be drawn out of ourselves. And, and, and the question becomes, what can I give? 
How can I be a part of the flourishing? And so that's, uh, ironically enough, that's what Serve the City Saturday is all about. October 23rd, that Saturday, coming together, 9 to 1. It's Saturday morning. Like, I know you want to be upstate apple picking, like grabbing coffee with a friend. This is a way of enacting the kingdom. And I wanted to give us a bigger picture, a bigger vision for us to seek the flourishing of our neighborhoods. Because as we partner with local organizations, as we pick up trash, meet tangible needs, take graffiti off walls, what is it? They're little glimpses, right? It's the sun shining down on you on the sidewalk on a stormy day. It's a way of the kingdom being enacted. And so we're going to be doing hunger prevention at the Father's Heart, um, graffiti removal right here in the neighborhood, uh, art in the park at Madison Square Park and Union Square. Um, we're going to be doing some trash pickup. And so please sign up. Uh, bring a friend. Uh, please, uh, please do not sign up the day before. That puts immense stress uh, on Elizabeth um, and, uh, and myself. And so if you're going to join, um, don't do it last minute. Let's sign up today. And then the last part we do need to realize, and I don't want to negate this, is that um, the good news of the gospel is for you. And so Jesus says, repent and believe. And so here are two questions as I wrap up today. Um, the two questions are this. What do I need to turn away from, and how do I need to lean on Jesus? I love this passage, um, how practical these words do not sound practical at all. Repent and believe, very practical words. Repent, it means to turn and go a new direction. And I think uh, for some of us, we, um, we don't need to feel sorry. We don't need to feel guilty, but we actually need to go a new direction. Like it's, it's time for some change and uh, something needs to be different in your life. And like these are those moments. I'll, I'll, afterwards, I'd love to pray with you, talk to you about that. But ultimately, it, it's I'm going this direction and my life is not going the right way. And we need to turn and go a new direction. That's what the word repentance means. And I don't, I don't want to oversimplify it. But the question becomes, what do you need to turn from? And it's personal. What do I need to turn from? And then the other cool thing is this word believe. Uh, the root word is actually pistis, uh, faith. It means to lean on. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the questions are actually postures. How do I need to lean on Jesus? Are there ways in your life that you're leaning on other people? Uh, you're, you're leaning on your job for a hope. You're leaning on something to really hold you up when uh, the invitation to Jesus is to turn, go in a direction. It's about the kingdom. And then what do you do? You lean on him in belief and trust that he will catch you. And so... Um, if you'd like, uh, let's grab the elements, the communion elements. And actually, I, you know, even, even in the, the, the realm of repentance, uh, these are uh, elements of repentance and belief. And so if you don't want to take them, like, no problem, or if you, you're like, I don't, I don't actually know exactly what that, that means, then... Um, that is totally okay. This is a moment where you can contemplate your spiritual journey so far, but uh, the elements represent Jesus' uh, body um, broken for us, um, the, the bread, and then the cup uh, represents Christ's blood um, spilled for us. And each week we take this uh, to participate in this kingdom story, right? We take this to be a part of what Jesus is doing, and it's a visible means of an invisible um, grace. And so... I'm going to pray over these elements, and then I'll read this passage of Scripture, and we can take these together. And so, God, thank you for today. Uh, just almost like, um, almost like a small glimpse of your kingdom story, ways that we're uh, allowed to participate in it, but also ways that um, we see that we want change in our life. And... Through this passage, it's almost like your invitation to us is to come up under your story and the way that you um, tell your story, the form and its content actually um, show us that change is possible for us. And so I just pray that um, as our church is growing, as, as um, we want to gather and be in communion with one another, I pray that it wouldn't be about some show or sitting in this room, but it would actually be about, our community would be about um, your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. And um, as we take these elements, Father, would you remind us that we are completely sustained um, by you and your son, Jesus.